Okay, so today what we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about uh, chapter two material, which includes distributions, uh, graphs, and uh, basically looking at graphs and trying to understand how to analyze them and, and interpret uh, what we see in the graph. So to talk about data, what I, what I really should be talking about is, and I'm going to use an example, is just the different measurements that I've collected from different individuals in my sample. Today, uh, my population is toasters, and so each individual toaster is part of my population. And my sample are the toasters that I saw when I clicked on Google and, and then went under shopping. And the variable that I'm looking at in this particular instance is uh, the price of the toaster. So these are just to different toaster prices that I found on Google. So you can see that there's a toaster for $69.99, there's a toaster for $299.99, and no, that's not a joke, uh, that is a KitchenAid toaster. There's a toaster for $36.46, $39.99, and so on and so forth. And the last one you can see that I, I looked at on Google was $299.95, and there are literally two toasters that hit almost the $300 mark. The last one, of course, uh, can be connected to your smartphone, <clears throat> which is incredibly important when you're toasting bread. Um, but these are just 16 toasters that I found the prices for online. Once we collect our data, we want to organize our data. So if you look at, uh, on this slide, we have our toaster prices from the previous slide. And when we look at these toaster prices, it's a little bit difficult to say how much a toaster in the year 2020 cost. I mean, is it $69.99? Is it $299.99? I'm already feeling like I can't afford a toaster. But if you look closely, you'll see some of them are $12.99. Some of them are $14.99. Right, so we have a $12.99. We have a $14.99. It looks a little bit more approachable. The way that we can kind of convey this data then uh, would not just be in a list of different prices. What we might want to do is create a distribution. A distribution is basically a way to describe the structure of a particular data set. So it gives us a way to really get an idea about the measurements on, on our data, or the measurements on our, our individuals from the population. A frequency distribution is a type of distribution that what we're going to do is we'll break our um, values up into categories or classes and then we'll count the number of times we have a data value fall into that class. The frequency would be then that number of times that the value falls into that class. So for example our classes since we're dealing with with, uh, with uh, prices our classes could be things like zero dollars to 49.99 $50 to $99.99 and so on and so forth. And anytime you have a value fall in between those two numbers, then it's counted as being part of that class. So here, um, that $14.99 and the $12.99 are probably gonna be in the same class because they're both relatively inexpensive toasters. When we look at classes then and count how many times we have something fall in that class, it starts to give us a better idea about the prices of toasters. Is it reasonable to expect that I'm gonna spend $299.99 on a toaster? So classes, what they are, is they are the different categories that we break our uh, values into. So here we're looking at the price of toasters still. And what I've done is I've broken them into classes, $0 to $49.99, $50 to $99.99 and so on and so forth. Then the frequency is the number of time I found a toaster in that particular range. So there were nine toasters between $0 and $49.99. There were five toasters between $50 and $99.99. Zero of them between $149.99 and so on and so forth until eventually there were two toasters in that $250 to $299.99 range. Just looking at, this is a frequency distribution, just looking here, I realized very quickly that the majority of toasters should cost me less than $50. I can go for a little more upper, uh, nicer end toaster at still between 50 and 100 bucks. Or I can break the bank and I can buy one of those really expensive toasters that can communicate with my phone. 
So when we look at this, it gives us a good feeling as to where that data actually falls. And we realize that those toasters that are in that upper echelon, that 299 range, are actually sitting way, way, way above the rest of the toasters. Now just a couple of vocab words here. When we look at the classes, we have a lower class limit, which is the smaller number. So if I look at that second class, maybe, that smaller number is 50. That's the lower class limit of the second class. The upper class limit is the larger number. So the larger number is that 99.99. So those two numbers, um, they, they give me the lower class limit and the upper class limit for that second class. If I look at um, the class width, class width kind of tells me how big a class is. And the way that I can figure that out is I can take two subsequent lower class limits and subtract them. 50 minus 0 is 50. And that's pretty much how many values fall inside any given class. So the, so the, uh, the class width is just take two subsequent classes and either subtract their lower limits or their upper limits. If I look at the class boundary, the class boundary I'm going to tell you about, but you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, the class boundary is basically that breaking point between two classes. So the class boundary between the first class and the second class is found by taking the halfway point between the 49.99 and the 50, the upper class limit of the first class and the lower class limit of the second class. And if you take that limit, it's 49.99.5 or 49.995. The reason we call this the class boundary is because in essence, you could have, if we were measuring prices down to the tenths of a cent, you could have something that needs to be rounded down or needs to be rounded up to fall inside the class. Now for our um, prices near to the nearest cent, we don't have to worry about that, but that's what the class boundary is essentially. Now the midpoint, the midpoint is, is the halfway point between the lower class limit and the upper class limit. It is the midpoint of the class. So say I take the first class, to find the midpoint, I'm going to take the sum of the lower limit with the upper limit. So I'm just looking at that first class, I'm going to divide it by 2. And here I get 49.99 divided by 2, because when I add it to 0, I get 49.99, and I get 24.995. So that is the midpoint of that first class. And again, we don't have to worry too much about midpoint, but it does become beneficial if you want to uh, later use that for, for graphic displays. So frequency distributions are pretty beneficial when we're trying to understand a set of data. Sometimes frequency distributions are not the most exciting thing in the world when it comes to understanding data um, because it's not, it's not a graphic display. And although I find a frequency distribution incredibly useful, if you were to put it in a newspaper article, it wouldn't grab attention like perhaps a graph would. And a graph is really just a, a way of displaying data. The first graph I want to take a look at is called a histogram. A histogram is a graph that displays the frequency of a class by using bar heights. You will notice on the bottom, what I've done is I've used the class boundaries. This is one way to, to mark off how a histogram is, is displayed. So on the horizontal axis, you'll see that I have these different values, the negative 0 0.005, 49.995. These values are the class boundaries. The reason why I put the class boundaries on this bottom here is because the class boundaries tell me what's in between the bars, kind of like where you where you break from one class to the other class. This is one way to display a histogram, and there are other ways as well. You could also put the midpoints right in the middle of the bars. But this bottom right here, this is actually a histogram where this bottom represents prices. So if I label this axis with prices, and then I can put in dollars, and the, the left-hand bar, this would be frequencies, or this would be the number of toasters. And what we see here is this one 
right here, this bar right here, this is a bar that runs from negative 0.005 to 49.995. So that's the class boundaries. So that's talking about that first class. And it is tall up to the nine. So that means that there are nine toasters in that class. And so a histogram, what it does is it illustrates very quickly how many toasters are in each class. And it's basically a bar graph where the, the classes are broken up from our, our quantitative data. So histograms are pretty useful. You notice that the bars actually touch. And the reason why we want the bars to actually touch is because in a histogram, when you hit that, that, that breaking point, you go from one class to the next class, um, that class boundary, that breaking point really is still a value that hypothetically you could land on. And so you want those bars to actually touch. Now you'll see that that last bar doesn't touch the first two bars. And that's okay, that's because there are no toasters between the price of $100 and $249.99. And that, that histogram still gives a pretty good picture as to what's going on. Other types of graphic displays that we want to know about are things like pie charts. In a pie chart, the size of the wedge of pie indicates the percentage or the number of, um, of individuals that fall into a particular category. This allows us to work with qualitative data. So here we have a pie chart that tells us uh, people's favorite pies. So you see that pumpkin has 36%. And for that reason, the wedge for pumpkin is much larger than the wedge for, say, strawberry, which is sitting at 2%. So that wedge is much smaller uh, than the pumpkin, pumpkin wedge. In fact, I want to kind of point out that this particular pie chart is not an incredibly good example of a pie chart. There are a couple reasons. Um, so let me just kind of point at the the size of the pie. So here we have pumpkin at 36%. We have strawberry at 2%. And if you look at the size of the pie for strawberry and the size of the pumpkin pie, we would think that the strawberry pie should be 1 18th the size of the pumpkin pie. But in this particular pie chart, it's actually misleading. So um, one of the things you want to look for, and because a, a lot of times we have seen pie charts before, is you want to look for, does it have a title? Are the, the, the wedges the corresponding sizes that they're supposed to be? I mean, does the cherry at 3%? So if you add up cherry at 3%, blueberry at 3%, and strawberry at 2%, that adds up to 8%, whereas that wedge looks about as big as that pumpkin at 36%. So one of the things you'll notice when you're looking in newspapers or Facebook or things like that, very off, off the bat, is does the graph actually display what it's supposed to? Because the strawberry pie should actually look a little bit closer to something like just this part right here, if this is a good pie chart. And that's because a pie chart should have that the wedges correspond to the frequency for that particular value. And in this case, this pie chart um, <clears throat> is misleading. And this is one of the good ways to catch whether or not something is misleading. Here's a bar graph. A bar graph is a graph like a histogram where the, the height of the bar indicates the number of uh, individuals that fall into uh, either the number of individuals. In this case, um, it's the amount of chocolate. So what this bar graph is trying to tell us is it's trying to tell us the Almond Joy has three units of chocolate. The crunch has three and a half units. The crackle has uh, two and a quarter units. Again, I've chosen this bar graph uh, because there are some issues with it. So again, a bar graph has bars whose heights correspond to whatever the y-axis is telling us. So in this case, it's the amount of chocolate. Some of the things that you want to look for when you're looking for whether or not a bar graph is somewhat misleading, and I'm kind of assuming that you've seen bar graphs before, <coughs> is how are we measuring amount of chocolate? Is it in weight? Is it in um, the amount of volume? What does that amount of chocolate kind of correspond to? Because um, we see we have three units for Almond Joy, Crunch has two, two and a half units. Maybe it's actually the percentage of the bar that's uh, uh, straight chocolate. 
The other thing you want to look for is in this particular example, notice that the Hershey bar, why it has five units of chocolate, it is coming out looking gigantic because the Hershey bar is also wide. So it makes the Hershey bar like look like it has, and completely honestly, Hershey bar is pure chocolate, but it makes the Hershey bar look like it has a gigantic amount of more chocolate than any of the others because of the three-dimensional, or really it's the two-dimensional aspect of this bar. It's allowing that bar to be the, the bigger width. In a good bar graph, you would have a title. This one has candy bar char. You would have axes that are labeled. Now this label of monochocolate is okay, but you should actually also tell us what you're measuring in. And this vertical horizontal axis should also be labeled you know, candy bars. You should also have that the height of the, that the uh, width of the bar is the same across all bars, and that the height of the bar actually matches up with the, the corresponding vertical axis. Stem and leaf plot is another type of graph that we will be looking at this year. For a stem and leaf plot, what it does is it's kind of like a histogram, but it actually gives us the data values. So each one of these leaves is a value from our set. So the six, the seven, the seven, the nine, these are each values. And the way the stem and leaf plot works is because it'd be too much information to just write down all the numbers, is it uses the stem together with the leaves to make each of the values. So if the stem is five and the leaf is six, then this corresponds to 56%. And we see that from the key at the very bottom. Whereas if the stem is nine and the leaf is three, then this corresponds to 93%. Each one of these corresponds to a different value seven and eight go to 78 percent we see that each one of these corresponds to a value uh, from our data set so we have 56 percent 67 percent 67 percent 69 percent 72 percent so on and so forth the stem and leaf plot is really nice because we get that picture from the histogram but we also get the individual data the one thing that you lose with the histogram is you don't get to see the individual pieces of data so on our toaster one from earlier, we knew that there was a $12.99 toaster, but it fell in that big class between zero and $49.99. So being able to see the $12.99 would be beneficial because it would tell us even more information. The con of a stem and leaf plot is that it's got a lot going on. And if you throw this into a newspaper, it's not, it's not as grabbing. It's not as pleasing to the eye. And so this is why you don't always see stem and leaf plots show up in newspapers, but it's very beneficial from a research standpoint. Last thing I want to talk about in this particular video is distribution shape. So when you're looking at a histogram, there are three different types of shapes that we want to look for. There is the symmetric distribution, which is symmetric. There is the skewed left distribution or left skewed distribution which means that most of the data is on the right-hand side or the larger side, but there's a little bit of data or a tail on the left-hand side. So that's why we call it left skewed, it has a left tail. And then there's the skewed right. Most of the data is on the left-hand side, but there is a tail on the right-hand side. So we call that skewed right. Now knowing what shape uh, distribution is, it's really beneficial because it tells us a little bit about the types of values that you see. If I say I have a skewed left distribution, what I'm saying is most observations are big and there's a few small ones. If I say I have a skewed right distribution, I say most observations are small, but there are a few large ones. In the toaster example, it would be skewed right. Most toasters don't cost that much, but there are a few that will break the bank. Here is an example of a skewed right distribution on the next slide. This is the distribution of annual household income in the United States. And we can see right off the bat, it has a tail on the right hand side. This part right here is supposed to actually keep on extending. It's supposed to just keep on going like way, way, way over to the right. And it's supposed to get really, really, really small. It has a really, really, really long, really, really, really skinny tail. Most observations are on the left. Most of the values are falling on the left hand side. We see, that the great majority of households 
fall in this range. The great majority of households are making less than $90,000 per year. In fact, the median household income, when we'll talk about median in the future, the median household income is 51,000, which means that half, this part right here is half of all households make $51,000. That right tail tells us a lot. It tells us that even though most people, most households do not make that much money, they make less than $90,000 a year, there are a few households that make more. And in fact, this is a really strongly right skewed distribution. There are a few households that make a gigantic sum way off to the right. And so you get an idea about this distribution just by looking at it. You get a feeling for uh, the actual um, distribution of household income in the United States. That's it for today. We'll talk a little bit about um, more of these ways to, to kind of interpret the data in future presentations. But um, that's all I have for now.